A God who's ever been alone cannot love by nature. Your behavior tells everybody what you actually believe. You can deny the truth of who you are. Transformation comes through revelation, not just information. You don't remember that you're a truth teller. Self-control comes from the inside out, but when you think you're a piece of crap. So sin has, has been defined for most of us as behavior. Welcome to the Impact Nations podcast. My name is Tim. I am your host. And today I'm very excited to welcome back uh, a guest that hasn't been with us in a long time, uh, Paul Young. Uh, he is the author of uh, novels such as The Shack and Crossroads. Uh, he's a Canadian, so you know we're going to have a good time. Uh, but today we're here to talk about Paul's book, Lies We Believe About God. Uh, he wrote this one a little while back. It's just a collection of essays that uh, I've been pouring over lately. And so I wanted to, to chat with Paul about it. And I asked him if he'd come on and he graciously agreed because uh, he doesn't know what he's in for so uh welcome to the show paul young i'm a canadian i don't need to know what i'm in for i just will apologize that's, we're that's right we're sorry <laughs> right off the bat sorry. we just want to say we're very sorry <laughs> Yeah, whatever happens, we're sorry. Yeah, one I uh, I was correcting an American friend of mine today for uh, spelling favor wrong, um, which uh, I yeah, often I do, and I I like to remind my American friends who spell favor just with an O and no U, that uh, for the rest of us in the world, when we pray and ask God for favor, we're actually getting twenty percent more favor than they are, uh, because wow. that's math. That's just we're other centered. It's all yeah. about you. <laughs> um. <laughs> Paul, I I don't even know where to start because this book um, is just so jam packed full of great stuff, and it's it really is a series of of individual essays that you've written. Um, maybe I'll ask the quintessential question that actually I don't ask many of our guests, but that is like why why did you write this? What motivated you to uh, either write or or publish this collection? You know, I I have some friends. I think I was with uh, Brad Jerzak and Baxter Kruger. And I was thinking about, man, we have a lot of lies that we believed, right? So we quickly came up with 150. <laughs> wow, that's depressing. <laughs> I, oh, my gosh. And it, it was actually quite interesting. And and so, because I was thinking like, man, I don't want my kids to grow up with these kind of lies. I just don't. And my grandkids, I don't. And, uh, and I'd done, you know, the three novels and stuff like that. And I thought, all right. But I wanted to tell stories at the same time, and uh, because they they wrap good theology, truth is always wrapped in good stories, and uh, and so that's what I did. Um, it was an easy book to write, and I loved my my people who got mad about it, uh, but they thought, oh, this is great. The phrase was, "He's no longer hiding behind fiction," <laughs> <laughs> and I said, wow. "You didn't read Eve, did you?" <laughs> and, uh, so so that's kind of where it came from and i just uh it was an easy one and because yeah. these things are so huge in the lives yeah. of many of us and yeah. it's like okay let's go after him i have nothing yeah. to lose well i i really enjoyed it I, I was telling you by email last week like i um for the way I read this book most recently was my wife and I were away for a little weekend getaway, just two nights away, just the two of us left the kids at home. Well, not at home at home, but with friends. Um, <laughs> but I just read aloud to her um, and uh, just full transparency. Like I was ready to to disagree with you on at least some stuff. And I was definitely ready for for my wife and I to have some good, healthy discussion on what what we thought maybe we didn't agree with and we'd come to the end of the chapter i said well what do you think she would yeah i think that's about right <laughs> and uh it just it really resonated with us so uh that's if if nothing else thank you for uh for helping us to have a wonderful weekend away where we really the each essay just led us into wonderful deep conversation about the goodness of god and about his beauty and about uh the nature of his love uh oh, and that's so uh, great thank you yeah Spirit. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, yeah, I, w I wanted to talk to you about something uh, that's later in your book, but I, I wanted to jump into it now only because we, on the last episode of the Impact Nations podcast, we actually, we were speaking with uh, Tina Harris, who's an author out of Australia, all about hearing God's voice. She's written a whole book on on hearing God's voice. And you've sure. got a, a chapter in here that talks a little bit about hearing God's voice and like, uh, tr we can sometimes you say trivialize what we 
think we might be hearing God saying because he deigns to speak in our language, like he speaks in a voice that is ours yep. effectively. Yep. Yep. Um, how do we tell the difference between just the voice in our head versus, oh, I'm I'm hearing from God? Take a risk. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is about encounter and relationship, right? This is this is tennis. I mean, this is back and forth. This is uh, badminton in Canada. And uh, <laughs> I played a lot of badminton. The um, you have to learn to laugh at yourself. This is part of the beauty of community too. I mean, if if what you're hearing is serious, talk to the community of relationships that you're a part of, and that's that's really helpful. But it's a learning it's a learning and growth process because a lot of times, like I said in the book, we think we need to hear it like somebody else does. And part of this is because I ask, you know, my grandkids, where do you think God lives in you? Like, like where? And one of the things I like to say is, I bet you it's not an apartment in the left little toe. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a little apartment down there, but it's pretty dark most of the time. And uh, <laughs> so it's like he lives in all of me. He lives in my imagination. He lives in my creativity. He lives in my logic. He lives inside my relationships, my work, my body. And we can hear him through all of those things. You know, Bradley's little, Jerzak's little book, uh, Children, Can You Hear Me? Mm -hmm is such a beautiful little book that's so challenging for people that come from a background like I do, where the only way you could hear God was through the Bible, you know? And it was like, well, what happened to all those people who didn't have it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like the guys who wrote most of the New Testament or those who wrote the Hebrew scriptures, right? It's, it's like you take a risk and the more you assume that relationship, the easier it gets to distinguish. But my like my relationship and my communication with God is very conversational. It's very conversational. That's the way I am in terms of that relationship. I'm and I get things out of walking a maze or doing, you know, some of the meditational stuff, but I do it because a friend wants to do it. Or somebody is it's a situation where we can do it together. But most of the time it's conversational. Some, some has been in dreams and uh, some of it, especially the dream stuff, I usually don't know what it's about until later. And um, I've had some really powerful dreams, but you get to know the difference and you get to know when the voice says, Paul, you are such an ass. And you get to know the difference between that voice and your own you know, proclivity to shame, for example, mm. that, that voice I know now. And I know I can identify it pretty pretty much right away. But I also know the voice of love that says you're just being an ass. So the voice of love can you can you can receive that in love? Oh, absolutely. And that's different from shame? Yes. Very different. Shame is an attack against my ontology. Uh, guilt is I've done something wrong. Shame is I am something wrong. So if it is the voice of love, it will never be an attack against who you are. It will be about something that you've done. And yeah. uh so yes, and I I lived in shame for a lot of years, and so my sensitivity to that within myself is very strong. Yeah, and uh, and that's that's helpful in discerning what the voice is, right? You're yeah. hinting at something that I again I'm actually going to jump to one of the very last chapters of this book uh, because I I think it's really really important, which is like you talk about sin and separation from God, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But at first, I want to yeah. just talk about uh how you define sin because you were actually just hinting at it just a second ago can you just talk yeah. to us about when we when we think yeah. about sin maybe how to what what is uh the definition that most people would adopt immediately versus how how you define sin for us yeah and i don't disagree with the definition i disagree with how that definition is interpreted mm -hmm. and uh and this is a really important question because everything so much is bounded around the question of sin and uh, and so the Greek word itself, hamartia, should tell you what it is. The way it's interpreted is missing the mark. And then the question should be missing the mark of what? That should be our next question. And uh, But we never ask it. We assume that it's a missing the mark of perfect behavior according to the law, whatever that is that happens to be present in your life. So it's some form of imperfection. And you begin with that assumption, you're in, 
you're in deep trouble yeah. because all it takes is one moment thought whatever that is not inside the coded acceptability and and now you're down the hole again and now you're going to deal with shame because it happens a lot so yeah. what is sin ha martia ha is a negation like a dis or an un so it's not something and uh martia comes from meros which is origin or form so it's not behavioral at all it yeah. has a behavioral expression, but it's missing the mark of the truth of who you are, your origin or form. And then comes the question, so what is the deepest truth of who I am? What is my origin? And again, my people, the way I grew up, your origin and form was, yes, you were made in the image of God, but it got so screwed up that somehow you got a sin nature. Now, nobody tells you where that came from because nobody can tell you where that came from. It's just assumed. You know, you have total depravity, you have a sin nature. Well, you when you talk about nature, you're talking about ontology or the truth of your being. So if you have a sin nature, it's going to express itself in sin behaviors. But that's not the deepest truth of who you are. It's like, no, all this behavior is covering up something that actually longs to be a truth teller, longs to be good, longs to be kind. You know, I've got all these friends on death row and none of them long to be a killer. Hmm. Not one of them. The deepest truth of who they are is that they long to be a truth teller. They long to be kind. They long to be good. So where in the world does that longing come from? If that's the bedrock, then it can't be inside some form of a sin nature. It has to be in being made in the image and likeness of God, because that's the truth about God. God is kind. God is good. Yeah. God is a truth teller. So what that means is that our form and origin are being made in the image of God. That is deeper than anything else. And that violates the idea of a sin nature, fundamentally violates it. You, you can't have a sin nature and... A, a human nature that is created good at the same time. You just can't. So missing the, the mark of what? It's missing the mark of your origin, your ontology, to use the big word, your the truth of who you are. You're, you, you don't remember that you're a truth teller. You don't remember or you didn't know that you are kind by nature. You don't remember or didn't know that you are patient by nature. Now that changes everything. And it's not always easy because when you have a sin nature, you can blame everything that you're screwing around with on that sin nature. Mm. When you begin to realize that you're made in the image and likeness of God, it's like, now what are you going to do? Now here's an interesting thing. Nobody in the New Testament ever prays for patience. Nobody. Nobody prays to be kinder. Nobody prays to be long-suffering. Nobody prays to be a truth teller. None. Like you won't find it. Why? Because the assumption in the first half of every epistle, for example, is I'm going to tell you the truth of who you are. And in the second half of the epistle, I'm going to say, so stop acting like this isn't true. Put away these things because they're not true about who you are. You're much bigger than that. Yeah. Right. So that's the sin behavior that expresses itself when you don't know who you are. Like so when Paul's talking about the flesh and battling against the flesh, it, he's we have interpreted that I think in in many cases as sin nature. Like yeah, that's that's actually your natural state <laughs> and battle against your natural state. You're challenging our thinking saying actually no, that's your unnatural state. You need to get back to who who you truly are. Yeah, how many of us grew up where you had a good dog and a bad dog in a war inside you? Mm, yeah. Right. And so who are you going to feed today? Which you're one are you going to feed? Bad dog. Right. So how do you feed the good dog? Well, you do all the religious stuff and, you know, mm. make on top the top piece being pay your tithes. But uh, how are you going to feed the bad dog is you, you know, when I was growing up, you never danced. You didn't go to a movie. You yeah. Know, because don't I was smoke, feeding the you? bad dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so but my question was always, who is the one who chooses what dog to feed? Right. Because the chooser, if the chooser was the good dog part, it always choose the good dog stuff. 
Yeah. But since it tries to cho choose the good dog part of the time, but chooses the bad dog, this has got to be the bad dog. And um, it's just the bad dog trying to be something other than what it actually is. Yeah. And and that's where back to the same old thing. You got you got a good dog and a bad dog, but you're the one making the choice. So if you fail, this is you. But I'm, it's like, what do you expect? I have a sin nature. So I'm going to what? I'm going to fight it as long as I can until I get tired or until, you know, somebody crosses me or whatever it is that triggers me and I'm back to bad behavior. Yeah. And so sin has, has been defined for most of us as behavioral. Yeah. And it's not, it's like the flesh is all the lies that you have believed about yourself. Mm. Right. And, and that's, no, you're made in the image and likeness of God. You have the mind of Christ, right? You are pure by nature. When I, when I had my addiction to porn, which started at 12 years old, and I carried it until 38, right? And I tried all the behavioral modification stuff, except I didn't try. I was too ashamed to try a accountability group. <laughs> you know, a 12 step group. Well, we didn't have very many of those back in the days, but, but I tried self discipline. Well, guess what? Self discipline is not a fruit of the spirit. Hmm. It's an outside in morality code, right? Um, self control comes from the inside out. But when you think you're a piece of crap and you have a sin nature, there is no inside that has any value. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. All you've done is accommodated and try to please Holy Spirit help me make the right choices. Well, it doesn't seem the Holy Spirit's very good at it, you know, at helping me, especially with a porn addiction. So I carried that until 38. And then when I blew up the world, I had to either figure out how to deal with this and change stuff because nothing was really working. It was just temporary. Mm -hmm. And that's when I began to see on the inside that the truth of my being is that one, I'm self-controlled, and two, I'm pure of heart. And when you find out that you're pure of heart, instead of being a piece of crap that is trying to do the right thing because you do love God and you want to, you want to be free and all those kinds of things, when you find out that you're pure of heart, you've always been pure of heart, you just didn't know it. Hmm. It destroyed my porn addiction from the inside, yeah. right? And self-control. I didn't have to try to find some behavioral modification outside in self-discipline. I am by nature self-controlled. I am patient by nature. I'm kind by nature. And when you begin to realize that that's not, you know, just a, a positivity statement, mm -hmm. that's the truth. Yeah. And, and I am by nature good, kind, loving, long-suffering. I don't have to keep a record of wrongs. You know, these are all in the first Corinthians 13 passage. Yeah. You know, things that are true of God. Therefore, there are things that are true of me. Love mm -hmm. does not. I am made in the image and likeness of love. I am by nature loving because not only because of that union, but because of being made. Yeah. I'm a child of God. I have God's DNA. And part of that is that I'm loving and I'm kind. Yeah. I haven't had any issues with porn since 38 years old that's what 40 30 years ago as i'm listening to you paul i i wonder about like i, I kind of want to just jump in to go read some scripture again because uh i i'm reminded of paul's back and forth in uh romans in romans seven. seven and eight right and i just yeah. i want to go reread romans seven right now in light of what you've just shared um because i think that it has been interpreted uh by many of us in 21st century Western Christianity as that, you know, do I feed the good dog or the bad dog sort of a thing, you know, bad dog being uh, Romans seven and a uh, good dog being Romans eight. Uh, and yet I, I suspect that we could read that in a very different light, given what you've you just absolutely said. can read it in a different light. And just look at the first couple verses of Romans eight, which is the great declaration, right? Who yeah. can free me? Well, I'm free, right? And yeah. it's like, ah, oh, all that back and forth stuff, it wasn't working. Yeah. You know, yeah. I want to be this. I can't be this. 
That's exactly the kind of turmoil that most of us have lived with, trying to live a holy life. Why would God say, be holy as I am holy? I mean, is that is that a threat behind something that requires performance? Be holy? Hmm. Holy is whole. Be a whole person like God is a whole person, hmm. right? And yeah. it's and why would it be a command if it wasn't possible? You know, live your life based on the wholeness, the truth of who you are. Express that because it's yeah. true. And that's what I was saying about Paul's epistles, that you read the first half, but all the preaching is done in the second half. Hmm. So they come into the morality of the second half thinking that the first half it doesn't even exist. Yeah. And the first half is I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be open so that you could see, you could see, you could see, you could see the truth of who you are. Now that you see the truth of who you are, stop doing this crap. Yeah. If you can see the truth of who you are. And so, you know, transformation comes through revelation, not just information. And a lot yeah. of us, we need to see it on the inside. And, and the beautiful thing is when people hear the good news, because this is good news, it's hard work good news, but it's good news. All of a sudden, they resonate on the inside and they start to cry. It's like, I can let go of all of that turmoil and all of that work. I knew there had to be something better. Yeah. you know. And it's just not positive thinking. Positive thinking is always just temporary because it's an external kind of forced action. Mm. This is an actual relationship of love where I get to live from the inside and I get to sit right inside the truth of who I am. Yeah. And I don't have to go looking to perform in order to get into the truth of who I am. It is mine by nature and by union. Yeah. All right. So now that we've got a clear understanding of sin, let's let's talk about its effects a little bit. Because you talk about uh, separation from God. The, the, there, you believe it's a lie that sin separates us from God. And so you start by defining sin as we've just done. But let's talk about the nature of separation because I, that is, sure. um, and I mean, the the word separation does exist on a few occasions in terms of, uh, in sometimes like Romans 8, where it says, hey, nothing can separate us. Um, but there are a few times when, like I'm thinking in Ephesians, uh, where he says, hey, you were separated from God, um, but he's saying because of the cross. So I guess, where's my question? Uh, first off, were <laughs> we separated and no longer separated by, because of the work of the cross? Like that that work is finished, and so sin can no longer separate no. us? Well, if if Romans uh, 8, that nothing can separate us, is and Ephesians are actually in contradiction. <laughs> right. Well, okay, so, but let me push back on that real quick, because the argument okay. I've heard is, well, yeah, but Romans 8 is speaking to believers. Like, it's, it, uh, we'll use the the uh, the more modern term, Christians. It's say, well, Christians can't be separated, but those other people, you know, that's not what yeah, Romans yeah, 8, yeah. The, it, Rome, it, Paul wasn't talking to them. He was only talking to the church in Rome. Well, interesting. Well, let's go to... Let's go to a couple other pieces, um, like John 1. Not mm. anything that has come into being has come into being apart from him, right? All of creation is created in Christ. That by itself at least annihilates one sense of separation, mm. is that where was creation created? Like it was space doesn't exist until creation happens. What's outside of God? Nothing's outside of God. Like nothing. Yeah. And the only place to create is within the very being of God. Mm -hmm. So... That's one piece, and Colossians 1, 16 and 17 would say the same thing. I love Acts 17, right? Acts 17, because it's not talking to Christians at all. No. It's not talking to believers at all. And, uh, and, and just like John 14, on that day, you'll finally know that I'm in the Father, you are in me, and I'm in you, right? He's not talking to people who've said the sinner's prayer. These are a bunch of ragtag guys who are ready to get a split a hundred different ways. And uh, so Acts 17, Paul's talking on a Mars Hill um, to pagans about their God that has no name, you know, and uh, he's saying, I know, I know who this God is. And so he attracts quite a bit of attention. But in that statement, he says things like, you all live and move and have your being. And God has given to everyone life and breath and everything. Yeah. Right. You all, and you are children of God, all of you. You are all children of God. So, so you can, you can look. The question is so, how can 
Jesus say to Peter, get behind me, Satan, right after he's saying, well, flesh and blood didn't tell you this? Or how can he say to the Pharisees, you are, you are of your father, the devil, right? So let's go back to our distinction between truth of being and ways of being. Wholeness is when the ways you live are, are an actual expression of the truth of who you are. So that's like an in, integra, uh, integrity, two sides of an equation equal each other, mm -hmm. right? Ways and truth, they equal. So in God, you never have God violate this kind of integrity or wholeness. The ways of God always are an expression of the truth of God, always, right? So when Jesus says something like, you are of your father, the devil, is he making a statement about the truth of who they are, like their ontology? Well, no, they are all children of God, Acts 17. So we already know that they are ontologically, the truth of their being is that they are offspring, since you are all offspring of God, you know, and in Acts 17. So we know that by nature, they are all created in the image and likeness of God. They are all indwelt by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son indwell them, which drives my people nuts because they want that separation. At least gives them a sense of a place to stand um, and define themselves as opposed to those people, right? They may not be good at this, but at least they did something. And... Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's kind of ticks them off when those people out there actually love better than those people in here. That's just another problem. Um, so, again, <laughs> is he is he talking about the truth of who they are or, you know, get behind me, Satan? Is is Jesus saying you're actually Satan? No, he's saying that you are adopting the ways of the accuser. Hmm. You are you are now self-important. You are now ready to kill somebody if that's what it takes. These are all the ways of the evil one, right? As opposed to kindness and goodness and the fury of love, where, where the aim is not at the person, but at the things that keep that person from being fully human and fully alive, that kind of stuff. So the question is, in this passage, is he talking about an ontological separation or is he talking about a separation in which they have alienated themselves? Alienated is a term that, ba uh, that Bradley and I love because there is no separation inside of that word. There is a turning away inside mm. of that word. And you can, and you can, what is the phrase? You can turn away, you can shut your eyes or turn away from the sun. Does it not mean it doesn't mean that it stops shining, right? So you can deny the truth of who you are, but it's still the truth of who you are. You cannot destroy the image and likeness of God in you by any choice you ever make. You cannot, you cannot annihilate the covenant that God has made with you because it is unconditional. I, my people love to say the word unconditional love, but they, they hardly believe it, you know, because they got lots of conditions. And um, and so, you know, unconditional love would be only that which applies to our people, not to yep. those people. Right. Mm -hmm. So and so when it when it says agape, God does not keep a record of wrongs in First Corinthians 13. That's a real that's a real difficult phrase because, you know, hell and most things in terms of us, them require uh, keeping a record of wrongs. Yeah. Like if, if you haven't said the sinner's prayer, which, by the way, is only 200 years old. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't done that, then we're going to keep a record that you didn't do that. Right. So when it says separation, it's not just talking about something that the cross heals ontologically though you were included in Christ before you were included in Christ when Christ was slain before the foundations of the world, right? You were included in him. So the work of the cross was done in you prior to even creation or at the very beginnings of creation. So it's talking behaviorally. You are separated from the truth. You are blind and lost, especially if you think you know the truth and you and you don't. When you when you reduce 
this relationship to a list of performance orientation, you are blind. You do not know who you are. And the more you do that, the blinder you are. And the problem is that then you, uh, what did he say against the Pharisees? Then you make, uh, the word is basically a disciple of yourself and and uh, mm -hmm. you'll be, you know, so much times the hell that you have created, right? <laughs> and uh, and it's just like, no, this, is, this has got to be so simple that it works for a child or a yeah. first century slave or yeah. a Roman centurion or, mm -hmm. a, you know, whatever political party that you're a part of. It's got to work <laughs> for anybody that's inside of those things. And this is simple. You're made in the image and likeness of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Yeah. You know, not height, depth, width. doesn't matter. So that alienation, is that more about our experience? Uh, because it, you'll hear people say, and, uh, to, you know, I want to validate their experience. Like, the, uh, I'm not, I'm feeling separated from God. I'm feeling oh, yeah. like I'm not yeah. close to him. I'm not hearing from him. And then, of course, somebody will very quickly, well, is there sin in your life and things like that? I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> I know. Well, Jesus experienced alienation. I was just going to say, of course, he, yeah. he cried out from the cross, you know, um, why have you forsaken me? Which which was a quote of Psalm 22 and points to a, a whole bunch of uh, beautiful prophetic stuff that, that we need to explore. Certainly, we've talked about that on the show before. But I do think that also it, it's reasonable to believe that he was experiencing that or feeling that in that moment. Absolutely. And, and not just his own. I, and I, frankly, between you and I, <laughs> I think the cup he didn't want to he didn't want to endure or swallow was that cup of alienation hmm. because this is Jesus who has never known one moment of existence in which he didn't know the father's love and presence. And now he's got to enter into our entire, the, uh, the humanity's entire sense of alienation, which is our experience of God, where are you? I can't feel you. I can't sense you. Where are you? So what we do is I can't feel you, I sent I can't sense you. So I'm just not going to believe in you anymore. And what yeah. Jesus does in Psalm 22, middle of it, you do not despise the affliction of the afflicted nor will you yeah. turn your face from him and when he cries you'll hear. Why would Jesus if he actually believed in ontological separation, which has got a huge theological problem is you've separated yes. now God into two gods, or at least a big God and a little man or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but, but why would he say, but into your hands, I commit my spirit. That's trust. Hmm. He chooses the path of trust in the middle of all the emotional expressions and feelings of alienation, right? He makes yeah. the choice to trust love. And, and he did it with all of us in him crying out, where the crap are you? Yeah. Right? And he, he then takes us with him in his choice to trust. Mm. And when he died, wow. we died. And That's when beautiful. he rose, we rose. It is yeah. beautiful. <laughs> it is beautiful, as it should be beautiful. But it's also wrenching. Because here is God who can sense as a human being the full extent, not restricted to that time, but the, the gathering of all times and all damage and the killing that's happening in the Middle East and the killing that's happening in the Ukraine and the killing that's happening in tribal cultures and in the world that I grew up in and all of that and all the losses all come crashing in on him. And he says, where are you? but into your hands I commit my spirit, mm. you know? I'm all yours. Yeah. And uh, and he knew it was coming, but he hadn't experienced it until he was on the cross. Yeah, And mm. that cross tied everything together. Paul says in, in Colossians 1 that God reconciled all things to himself in that beautiful creed uh, or hymn that we have in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Um, 
that he he's reconciled all things to himself and you've got a beautiful there's a whole section that probably ticks some people off but uh it's just scripture (laughs) literally all it is is just scripture at the end of this book you just list every single scripture that really is uh laying out the the fact that he has reconciled all things to himself and that was always his desire that was always his will um and it's all it's all Oh and, yeah, all means if, all. If, right. <laughs> if if you're a Christian, supposedly you've already reconciled yourself to God, right? So you wouldn't need a verse like that. Mm, interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You, but and let, so let me ask you this: because the pushback things, I get, you separate. Yeah. Right. But the pushback that I get is uh, when I talk about like all means all. He's reconciled all things. Is well, yeah, yeah. But skip down a couple more verses to 23. And it says, but you know, uh, don't drift away. Right. Uh, he, he's warning us not to drift away, which I, I think, but you can't um, annihilate the reconciliation with that verse. You can't make those two things that are supposedly working together. Right, Cause I think that the drifting away is drifting away from the understanding of who you truly are. It's, it's drifting away from you, the truth of who you are made in his image, the truth of your reconciliation already having been done. And it is the drifting into alienation. Uh, you can't yeah. choose whether you you can't choose whether you were reconciled or not. You can't born yourself again. That's the point. You can't you cannot born yourself from above. But you can alienate yourself from the reality of that, just like you were saying. Let's talk a little bit about the word faith, because who who does the saving, right? Like, uh, let's say we do need to come to a place of of recognizing the truth of who we are, of who we've created to be, that we are, are kind and, and generous in these things. Uh, we need to come to a place of recognizing like our, our need for Christ. Um, but that and we would say that's coming to faith right i i've come to faith in christ or i've put my faith in jesus whatever um yeah you're the, that's some a redundant of the, statement some of the well some of the translations right make it sound like it's our faith and yet i think uh-huh. and nt right does a really good job of this talking about how actually if you read the greek carefully and and look at it in the context of of paul's arguments that usually that can and should be translated as the faithfulness of jesus not our faith in Jesus. Even more so, it is Jesus. It mm. is. If you read uh, Hebrews, you know, faith Faith is, right? It's Faith is the hypostasis, the substance, hypostasis. And it's only used, hypostasis is only used three times in Hebrews. And the first two earlier ones identifies hypostasis as Jesus. Faith is Jesus. And so it's not even... It's not even the person's independent choice as if they were outside. It is our, the opening of our eyes to our union with Jesus. And by faith, they did this. They looked forward. By faith, they looked forward. By faith, they, right? That whole passage. Yeah. And But it makes it, it's like faith is the substance of that which they were looking forward to. What's the substance it's Jesus. And mm. you look at the two passages, look up hypostasis and where they are in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, and they identify that yeah. that hypostasis is Jesus. And so we want to we want to think that we can do something independently that is good. There is no independently. Yeah. That's that's mythological. This is about <laughs> This is about whether we are alienated from reality or we are we are submitting ourselves to the truth. Yeah. Which is kind of an odd thing. We are accepting that that the truth is what we want to be embraced by. Right? Is that what is that what Jesus means by being born again? Yeah, the born again thing is born from above. And when he's talking to Nicodemus He's like, Nicodemus, you're like the teacher of Israel and you don't know this. It's like, this should be just common sense understanding, right? You don't know the valley of dry bones, you know, you know, how about Adam? Adam couldn't born himself, you know, the breath had to be breathed in him so that he could become a living being. And so it's, again, you know, we've attached the sinner's prayer or something like that to that passage. There's no sinner's prayer, and Jesus never asked anybody to pray a sinner's prayer, and uh, so it's like no, this 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 birthing 
and it's into the reality of the truth and the truth of who you are, the truth of who God is, all of that is done by the Holy Spirit in us. And, and our participation is we can trust it or not. And if we don't trust it, guess what? The Holy Spirit will expose that parts of us that will not trust. That's the promise of love. Because why would, you know, with our kids, why would we not oppose the things that keep them from being fully human and fully alive? Why would we not oppose it? And, and it's not like we can force them. A lot of times we like to play what we think the Holy Spirit would do because uh, we don't trust the Holy Spirit in them, you know. And uh, so we tend to play the Holy Spirit. But this is, love is opposed. And so the promise of exposure is a promise. It's not a threat. The Holy Spirit has come to convict. And the word convict is the word to expose. Why? Because the unexposed is the unhealed. So God is at work in the heart of each person to expose and then to destroy that which keeps them from being fully human and fully alive. That is the fiery fury. That is the, that everybody is, is salted with fire. Everybody is salted with fire. Yeah. But it's always love because the ways of God cannot be anything but the truth of God expressed. Folks, we are hanging out with Paul Young uh, and chatting ostensibly about uh, his book, uh, Lies We Believe About God. Uh, this has been fantastic, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to pause for just a very quick station break. You're listening to the Impact Nations podcast. Now, you might be saying, uh, what is this clever name, the Impact Nations podcast? Well, we are Impact Nations, and we named this podcast before we knew it was really going to be a thing. Uh, so it's not a very clever name, but we are Impact Nations. Now, what is Impact Nations? Uh, we believe, uh, probably just like you, that the gospel has got to be big enough and powerful enough to transform every part of life. Uh, the gospel cannot be, as we've just been talking about, just a, hey, you got to pray this prayer uh, and then you can get right with God, but rather <clears throat> it should be uh, restoring life as it's intended to be. Uh, that's what Jesus began the mission to do was reconcile all things to himself, to restore life to the way, the way it was intended to be in the first place. And we as followers of Jesus get to participate in this incredible mission. And for us at Impact Nations, that means we've been called to do that uniquely in the developing world uh, where we are going to um, some of the most vulnerable populations, rescuing people from danger, whether that's uh, human trafficking or forced prostitution, uh, gang violence, teen pregnancy, homelessness, slavery, you name it. Uh, we're just running into the darkness with the message that, hey, you were created in God's image and he has so much more for you. And we get to rescue him out of that danger and begin to just show them that they were indeed made in his image and that they are beautiful, that they have dignity. Uh, and then we help them uh, get back on their feet, mentor them, disciple them, uh, get them the skills, the hard skills that they need to be able to flourish long-term so they can provide for themselves and for their families. So we're helping them to become more independent. Uh, and we're doing it all over the world. We're having a lot of fun doing it. Uh, so I would encourage you, uh, check out impactnations.com. You can go there. Uh, you know what, you can sign up for free free ebook. And at the same time, you'll get, end up on our email list and you'll learn all about all the things that God's doing around the world. We're having so much fun. If you'd like to give, um, it does take money to to get these things done. Uh, there's a big red button there that says give. Uh, give something. Uh, help us get it done. Uh, and I can tell you, when you give today, by tomorrow, your funds are going to be uh, somewhere like Malawi or Uganda or India or Nepal, uh, probably ministering to uh, a very desperate young woman who is facing unbelievable challenges. And you're going to get to play a part in demonstrating the love of Jesus to them and showing them that they were indeed made in God's image. So check it out, Impact Nation. Uh, click give. And if you're really wild and crazy, give monthly, even like 15 bucks a month, something just helps us to get more done. So um, that's all I have to say about that. And now back to your regularly scheduled program, uh, where we were hanging with Paul Young. Um, Paul, I love uh, what you're doing. Just, uh, just saying. <laughs> thanks. We're having fun. It's so great. It's so much fun to see the gospel really penetrate entire communities and, and bring transformation, bring change, uh, and be reminded that, uh, boy, God is good. <laughs> He's so God good. is good. You know, yeah. a lot of, a lot of us white people, when, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a missionary kid, right? Yeah. I want to talk about so, that for a second. Yeah. So the intention was really good. When my mm. parents went, the intention was really good. Part of what has caused so much damage down the road is that 
that we hook culture, the culture of Western Christianity, to what we were doing without thinking about it. And, and so we, we were trying to get people to change their cultures, not to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God sits above cultures, right? I don't care if it's a if it's a uh, Muslim culture, Jewish culture, Christian culture. So it the culture is one thing, but but a a Muslim person will be able to tell you what a Muslim who is living life as part of the kingdom of God is. They'll be able to tell you, but they will be able to also tell you what it means just to be a cultural Muslim. And uh, so if you've got a Muslim who is violent, obviously they're not part of the kingdom of God. If you've got a Christian who wants, who says it's okay to kill people, obviously they're not part of the kingdom of God. Not in yeah. that way, not in yeah. that action. They're, they're culturally that way. You talk about putting people in categories a lot. And we yeah. tend to do that. I, I don't know if it's just, it, it's easier to think of them that, but like, instead of seeing people, as an image bearer, we tend to like, oh, yeah, I've got you figured out. You are you fit into this particular box. Um, why do we do that, and how can we stop doing that? Um, the word in the Greek for accuser or accusation is categorical or categorizomai. That's partly why I talk about it, because to categorize someone is an accusation against them. Mm. So, so it's... Um, uh, we find it is easier to annihilate a category than to get to know a human being, right? It's just like I was saying, the guys on death row who are my friends, and they are truly are my friends. Um, those guys are easily categorized by the world. You know, they're the animals on death row. If you take the risk of actually getting to know these guys, they violate the categories just by being a human being. And that's what you're saying when you talk about image bearers. They are image bearers. And uh, so why do we... Uh, we do it because we're so used to playing the power game, separating ourselves, alienating mm -hmm. ourselves from people. Um, it gives us a sense of power and groupthink and all those things that we are used to. How do we stop? Ask the Holy Spirit to open up your inside eyes to the beauty of the other. And make make a commitment to watch your language and how you categorize. Yeah. You know. Um, yes, there, you know, there is ways to understand people when I say the Muslim culture, the, I'm, am I categorizing? I suppose in some senses, but there's no malice and there's no distinction. When I say that. The kingdom of God, I'm saying that which everybody is a part of, whether they know it or not, whether they know it or not. And uh, and frankly, there is lots of things about Christian culture that are worthy of accusation. And uh, But there are ways to make, when I say, you know, a Muslim, I'm making an observation as a generality. And that's helpful. But I'm not putting them into a category in order to malign that category or to annihilate it. It's not an accusation. It's an observation. There's a there's this funny little passage uh, in in First Timothy four ten uh, where Paul says Jesus is the savior of all, but especially to believers. I know, it's, uh, and it's and funny. maybe he's doing a little bit of categorizing himself right there. But like, does that mean that we're better than others, <laughs> or that we are in more need? <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's an interesting interpretation. Well, yeah, I mean, he's savior of all, especially believers. You know, because Timothy's dealing with a bunch of difficulties within his community of faith, you know, so it's yeah. like especially believers. <laughs> and um, so, so uh, I, I think it's, I think it's either that kind of funny uh, backhanded thing because um, he's writing to Timothy, right? It's not for publication. And yeah. uh, so that's, that could be it. And Timothy's like, Oh, you're so funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, he is the savior of all. And, and maybe, you know, the other way to look at it could be that it's like, especially for believers in the sense that they have made the choice to follow Jesus at this point. So it's more of a real life experience at the moment, yeah. even though mm. it applies to everybody. 
I think yeah. that's that's a possibility, but I still yeah. like the back backhanded comment. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um all right, let's let's talk evangelism for a little bit because if we've got uh we want to avoid an us versus them, like, oh, yeah, we're in the camp of believers, and then there's yeah. everybody else. But, yeah. you know, he's especially Savior for us. Um, how do we – you you share a frustration of mine, which is that, you know, uh, evangelism often tends to turn this on, almost into a sales job where everybody's a mark, everybody's a potential client here, and I'm yeah. going to get them – I'm going to get them uh, – the, I'm going to turn this prospect into a customer. Um, yeah. And how – how do you like to tell people about Jesus and invite them to become awakened to the fact that they have been saved and that they have mm. been made in his image? So, you know, in line with that too, I don't like the word ministry, mm. you know, the act 17, this is not a God who can be served by human hands as if he needed anything. Mm. Right. So ministry always smacks. And I've, I've talked to the guys on death row about this, you know, Ministry always smacks of superiority and separation, right? That I'm yeah. going, I'm here to do something good for you because you need it, right? It's identifying that that they have something that I have that I can give to them. And, uh, and I just don't like that stuff. I don't like evangelism wrapped up into um, any sense of superiority. I think that's caused a huge amount of trouble in the kind of, uh, cultural gospel that we've spread around the world. How do I like to? Um, Francis of Assisi said, you know, always be ready to proclaim the gospel and when necessary, use words. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like to live the good news. You know, the burning bush did not chase Moses anywhere, right? By being a burning bush where everything that is is not human and living is being burned up yeah and everything that is living is becomes more visible there's a verse that says we are the aroma of christ to god we are the aroma of christ to god for those who are perishing it's an aroma it's an aroma from life to life and for those who are being saved it's an aroma from death to death hmm. right so this is this is a kind of way to look at the burning bush, right? So for those who are being saved, that would be you and me today. <laughs> some, <laughs> some days I'm perishing, you know, and uh, for, I'm serious. For those who are being saved, it's an aroma from death to death. That is dying to the centrality of self, dying to my stupid ideas about the violence and genocidal God that I believed dying to, you know, uh, not living out of the truth of who I am, all those things that I thought were home, but turned out to be prisons, right? That mm -hmm. those things have to be burned away for those who are perishing. It's like the gospel keeps going like, boy, to them, to those who are perishing. Can you smell that? It smells different. It smells inviting it smells good it smells alive right and mm -hmm. it is the aroma of christ that we are to god so yeah. so that's the kind of evangelism i like that is one being present. everything being present everything is about being present being present to the person who's in front of me yeah. and i don't go anywhere unless i'm invited by the person who's in front of me or the situation that's in front of me and uh and so, plus, I'm not under the illusion or the delusion that if I don't say something, somebody's eternal security will be lost and mm -hmm. uh, their blood could be on my hands. That's the sort of gospel world that I grew up in, which I don't believe that anymore. And yeah. so anybody's eternal destiny is not dependent on my performance, right? I get it's to a lot be of pressure the presence. Off. Well, wow, huge. I mean, yeah. that's why missionary parents sent their kids to boarding school at five and six years old, because it was part of the altar laying, you know, as you're all on the altar kind of uh, thinking. And the yeah. children were secondary to the mission, which was to get people into heaven. And, uh, and so they sacrificed their kids. And it's, 
it's kind of horrendous what yeah. happened. And um, so, you know, the person in front of me is often my child or my grandchild. And, uh, and mm -hmm. so it's like being present. I want to be the aroma of Christ to God, whether they're perishing at the moment or they're being saved at the moment. But yeah. that, that just means that we're all goats sometimes and we're all sheep sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, does does your understanding of uh, we have all been saved, some just haven't become aware of it yet, um, does that suddenly eliminate the need for evangelism, the need to tell people about Jesus? I, I, I think that's probably one of the core criticisms of uh, what uh, many would call uh Christian universalism or Christ-centered universalism. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not a universalist, so I'm okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I'm not. Universalism, like you're saying, is often some form of determinism in which the cross isn't even necessary. Right. And so, yes, I mean, it's like saying for, for my grandchild to be fully inside my embrace as a grandchild, they need to know that they're a grandchild. I mean, it's like, yeah. duh. Yeah, for me to experience the reality of the beauty and the joy and the wonder, the community, the, the placement of my identity, worth and value and significance and security and meaning and purpose and destiny and community and love. Those, that's, that's kind of important, yeah. right? So, but how do we tell them? Do we tell them the good news that they're in, they've been included in Christ and now they get to, in participation with the Holy Spirit, work out their salvation, right? So there's different tenses for being saved, yeah. and we need to acknowledge that. And that one day, there will be the redemption of everything, which I don't understand what that looks like or how it happens. I know there are ages of judgment. I know that. But again, these judgments are intended to heal us, not to yeah. punish us. Hmm. And, um, and so, of course... Of course, anybody who asks, be prepared to give an answer to, you know, but it's going to be my life that speaks more than anything that I can say. It's going to be yeah. my care for the other, my, my presence in the life of another. Those are the things that will raise the questions. And I don't love because it'll raise the questions. I love because it's the way that I am. Yeah. Made in the image of God, participating with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So... So for me, evangelism is absolutely essential, but evangelism is absolutely unnecessary. And I'm using the word evangelism in two completely different ways. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, because that's quite a paradox. <laughs> well, it is, you know, the evangelism that we have created as going out there and getting people to switch cultures is not mm. only wrong, it's dangerous. And there's no there's no actual biblical precedent for it. As you said, Jesus never once leads people through a sinner's prayer. No, and look how he lives his life. He cares for people. He yeah. he is always invited into a conversation if it's only by presence. If somebody shows up to talk to him, that's an invitation. Yeah. Right? If somebody asks a question, that's an invitation. Mm -hmm. If so, if somebody stops him and touches his the hem of his garment when he's on his way to his best friend's death. He lives a life of interruptions and he responds to it. He's been invited by the actions of others. And so that's a different world. In yeah. fact, if he said anything, he usually hid truth inside of it. So it would be confounding. Yeah. And, you know, and again, it's like, who do you, who do you say that I am? You know, what's going on with the way that you see things? And, um, and it's, it's kind and it's kind to culture and it's kind to listen. And it it doesn't bury an agenda, mm. right? Good. Yeah. The art of relationship can so easily become propaganda and no longer is art anymore. Yeah. It's something at best harmful and hurtful and, uh, and at worst self-deceptive. What do you make of... Um, 
Peter's call and 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 Paul when they're preaching a call to repentance because uh, there is a call to respond. People say, "What must we do?" Like we want to experience this uh, this abundant life you're telling us about. What do we need to do? And he says, "Well, repent, be baptized, change your mind, change your right? mind." Yeah. yeah, it doesn't doesn't like oh well feel bad for a while, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like heart change to mind change to form change, right? You're the reason that you're saying. I want to live a different life is because your heart knows the truth. And now your mind changes your mind. And then the ways of your life will express that change. Right? It's it's a simple, beautiful thing. And so the call to repentance is because the heart is already crying out for, for change. And it's like, all right, transformation is by the changing of your mind. Right? And that means you have to make the choice to trust or not. That's the beauty of personal agency. We are always given personal agency because without it, there can be no love. And this is a relationship of love. So change. So when you go like Paul saying, stop doing this, he's not saying, okay, add it to the list. He's saying, because you're better than this. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You have been transformed. You have the mind of Christ, so stop this because your behavior tells everybody what you actually believe, right? Yeah. Your behavior tells everybody. If I want to know what somebody believes, all I have to do is watch their life, what they actually believe. Yeah. So if they're lying, if they're presenting a persona on Sundays, if they're cheating on their spouse, if they're getting drunk out of their minds. I know what they believe. It's easy to see, right? I don't, it's not an accusation. Yeah. But do they look at my life and see what I believe? Yeah. Right. Hmm. It's fruit. Yeah. That's my final apologetic. You can argue with my theology all you want. I dare you to argue with my life. <laughs> with the fruit in my life. I dare you yeah. to argue with my relationship with my wife hmm. and my kids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm not perfect at it by any means, but I am so much healthier than I used to be. And yeah. there's so much more integrity in my life than there's ever been. And and so how do you engage with people who, you know, we <laughs> when we started our conversation an hour ago, you said, oh, yeah, well, what people said when I wrote Lies We Believe About God was like, oh, he's, he's no longer hiding it in fiction. He's finally outed himself in, in nonfiction yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. With, with people who are upset with you or, or disagree with you with uh, varying levels of uh, force. Um, how do you engage with them? Because there is, I'll, I'll be honest, like throughout this book, and even in your introduction, there is this wonderful um, empathy, humility, uh, even in some of the stories you tell, uh, encountering with people, you, you operate from a place of compassion. How has it taken you a while to get to a place of just always coming into those discussions with with compassion did you used to get grumpy oh my gosh you know when i was when i did not know who i was i i always self-protected and self-promoted that is evidence of a false self right if you're around anybody who self-protects and self-promotes you know you're dealing with a false self you're dealing with the flesh and like paul says judge no one according to the flesh and um so for me you know when i wrote the shack I'd already hit the bottom. And so I wrote it out of love for my kids for a Christmas present. And regardless of what happened, the invitation was to create a false self to start taking, you know, credit for all of this. Like, why would I want to do that? Go through that hell again of having to, you know, have all that crap burned away. So I'm not at risk when somebody is after me. Um, it's not always easy because the beauty of an enemy is that they can push buttons that none of my friends would push. And that's a good reason to love them. And uh, because I have to think about what they're saying and it's a good check, it's a good, but I'm not at risk. So I don't, it doesn't bother me, you know. <laughs> Some of it's actually pretty funny. Being called the spawn of Satan by a theologian. I mean, that's, come on. Oh, yeah. I know. Who can live up to that, right? So, uh, so, so, but it, it doesn't. 
um, 99.9% .9 of the time doesn't bother me a bit. And, uh, and, <laughs> and sometimes, you know, the stuff that they uncover, they think is not public knowledge. My, my life's an open book. I don't have any secrets. You know, you can ask me about anything. I'll tell you. And, um, but I've had some really great things happen um, because of, <laughs> there was a big preacher up in our area in on, on big church. And he stood up, went viral. If you haven't read this book, don't. And then he talked about it. And I knew that at least he, he was, um, he was telling his people to do, not to do something that he hadn't done. Right. And I knew that he had, he hadn't read the book either. You know, it was easy to tell he hadn't read the book, but it, it went viral. And, and my kids said, what do you think about that? I said, you know, he probably just sold me more books than anybody else on the planet. Because where the law comes, sin abounds, you know, and, and he said, don't read it. So I contacted him and I said, look, would you be open to meeting me in a public forum to have a conversation about this? And he said, no. <laughs> I said, well, then I will meet you in whatever forum that you would choose. And he said, you'd meet me alone in my office? And I said, absolutely. So... I go up there in his office and we got, we spent about 45 minutes together, about 20 minutes in, he goes, how come every time I try, try to talk to you about theology, you talk to me about relationship. Hmm. And I'm like, we're never going to convince each other about theology because we don't even agree on the terms that we're using. Hmm. Right. So why, why waste the time talking about theology? I said, I do have a couple questions for you. Why do you hate women? And that's a why, subtle question. And why do you why do you think your followers are so mean? Hmm. And he thought about it and he said, let me tell you about the way I grew up. And he starts telling me about alcoholic parents, brother that had been in trouble with the law, about the violence and the way he grew up. And um, and he actually had a moment. He had a moment where it was like, I'm going on a sabbatical, short one. I really need to work some of this out. And mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of how we, we ended our time together. His his place eventually blew up a thousand different directions. So much damage, so much harm. He was getting death threats and all that. And through a back channel, I, I told him that we had a little guest house at our place that if he and his family needed to have a safe place, because nobody would ever think that he was <laughs> at my house. And uh, <laughs> I know, I know. And, uh, and, you know, he did not respond to that, but that's okay. It was the next right thing was to give him that space if he wanted it. But again, come on, what are we involved in here? Are we involved in, you know, are you going to be mad at me? Why? Why waste the time? You know, you've got, you've got better things to do, like loving the people that are in front of you. And what's the point of all this? And I don't, I don't personally want to be involved in creating more division in the world. I don't. And we got enough of it. It's just like I'm so sick of it that we've got to find a better way. And that means in my life to actively resist separation, you know, alienation. And I'm a human being, so I can actually separate myself, you know, in, in a sense. And uh, And, but when I do it, I know that I am perishing. And then the smell of the love of God, this aroma of someone who knows how to love well, love their enemies. You know, we, my people, you know, we will take literally six day literal creation, seven day literal creation on talking snakes and gardens and fish that swallow people and We'll take those literally, but we have a really hard time taking the Sermon on the Mount literally. You know, loving our enemies, you know, doing good to those who harm us. You know, the beautiful thing is if we become the target, we become the vessel, potentially. And uh, and that's a beautiful thing. Why? Why wouldn't we be gracious? Because in us 
Christ is filling up the sufferings of the cross in us. Like, look what I get to be a participant in, you know? And I get to participate with that love that then moves outward. And, uh, and I get to trust the ripples of that. And I've watched those ripples come back, so only some of them, because who knows what our lives are doing then. But it's a beautiful thing to participate. And it's a beautiful thing to respond in union with love, who is in us. This union of love is in us. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm. All right. Last question. Yes. <laughs> but Father, Son, Holy Spirit, why is it so important that we understand that God is three persons in one, not God the Father yeah. and, and maybe Jesus and the Holy Spirit sure. behind him or something like that? Yeah, there's a lot of good reasons. One of the best reasons is that if there is no multiplicity of persons within the nature of God, there's no love. You can't have love in a monad God, a God who's ever been alone. Because that a God who's ever been alone cannot love by nature. This is why certain of the monotheistic religions refuse to talk about God as love. They'll talk about God as, as being loving, kind, um, good, all of those other things, but not love, because then God would have needed the creation in order to be loving. And then whatever God needs is greater than God, so the creation would then become greater than God. Therefore, God cannot be loved by nature. Yeah. And that makes total sense within a singular, non-Trinitarian God. So the, another beautiful thing is that God not only loves the other, but loves the one the other loves. Right? It's not bipolar. It is communal. It is community of love. That's a beautiful thing. So everything that is true relationally is allowed to, allowed, actually exist in the very being of God eternally. Right? Because if God was alone and God creates this, now everything that is about relationship becomes a new experience for God. Hmm. Right? But this doesn't work. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting in the Jewish rabbis. In fact, I've got I got a, a number of books up here, the Jewish Trinity and books like that, where they go back into the Hebrew scriptures and show the Trinity everywhere in the wow. Hebrew scriptures, everywhere. The use of Elohim um, in the very first verse is at least three, at least three. Right. It's uh, the way that it's compounded and it just goes from there. And um, and it's. It's everywhere. So it's, and you know, it's the, it's the declaration of scripture anyway. The, yeah. the, the major event of the baptism of Jesus inaugurating an entirely new world that then goes on through the ascension is a declaration of the triune nature of God. So incredible, you know, so yeah, I like the Trinity. <laughs> I like the Trinity. Even, Me too. even though I use, even though it kind of pisses off some of my people because of the metaphors that I use, but my people aren't good at metaphors anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, this has been so much fun. Thank you for spending time with us today, uh, for just sharing yourself. Thank you for this book. Uh, folks, if you haven't picked this up, I would really encourage you. And maybe, maybe some of the books I've been recommending the last few weeks, you're like, oh, that's too big or whatever. This one is just a whole bunch of very short essays. I don't know. They're like maybe five pages long. They're and they're stories. stories. Yeah, they're just yeah. beautiful stories. Um, so you can just have it sitting on your on your uh, bedside table or coffee table or something. Just pick it up and read for a few minutes and it'll just encourage you. It'll challenge you, certainly. Um, but uh, it'll more than anything, folks, it'll point you to Jesus. Uh, and that's what I think Paul does a beautiful job of. Uh, so, Thank you, Paul, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, hey, if people have been enjoying this and they want to get more of your stuff, where's the best place to find you? Or you, you got anything you're pushing these days? What's going on? Nico and I, my one of my boys, started a the uh, Paul Young podcast. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's, it, we make it in the basement of this barn and, uh, and it's 15 minutes twice a week. 
Um, so you can just look up Paul Young podcast and it's on your, all these platforms. How do you stay but, to 15 minutes, man? I couldn't do oh, it. Oh man. So, but I wanted to, I wanted it to be, you know, fluid it has no theme to it. So it's mm -hmm. kind of whatever is happening in my world at any given time. Yeah. And uh, so it's easy that it's not interview centered at all. If I, I haven't done one yet. So, and it's just started. We're only like three weeks into it. So that's kind of fun. fun. Awesome. And, um, and then that weaves into all kinds of other stuff. So that's yeah. a good place to start. You got a website you can point people to as well. Okay. That, and paulyoungpodcast.com will take you to a website, but okay. yeah, Perfect. the wmpaulyoung.com, which I hardly ever visit, but it's got some resources <laughs> and things like that. It does it has some really good resources and some awesome. little things that I've written and stuff like that. Brilliant. And folks need to keep their eyes out. Cause you, I know you're working on a few books right now as well. So that's yeah. exciting. Yeah, um, it's very fun. Awesome. Well, uh, go check out that podcast. Cause if you're listening to this, you're a podcast person. So check out the Paul Young podcast. Uh, and Hey, uh, if you've enjoyed this hour, you want to stick around, uh, check it out every week. Uh, impact nations podcast, uh, is at YouTube, uh, uh, youtube.com slash at impact nations uh and by the way if you subscribe there you know hit the bell get the notifications all that stuff but the cool thing is we're always uploading really neat stories of just things that god's doing around the world um uh, by the way we're about to start feeding some families in gaza i think i had a meeting this morning wow. uh and we've got an open door to start feeding some families there so we we may be able to share some news about that soon uh so yeah if you subscribe on youtube you're going to get encouraging stories one way or the other plus some podcast stuff uh or if you like the podcast in audio form because uh, you don't think i look good enough for tv uh then you can do that uh, uh just look on your favorite podcast app for the impact nations podcast hit subscribe uh and uh, you can listen every week on your way into work or whatever um we're uh, uh, releasing an episode every Thursday uh, with fascinating people who just encourage me and bless me, just like Paul. Uh, this has been a wonderful hour, Paul. Thank you so much for being with us this week. I love you, Tim. Love you too, man. And uh, folks, we'll see you again next week. God bless. Have a great week. <laughs>